um, it also poses a, a problem which I'll be talking about, I guess, quite a lot, the, the issue of um, kind of the historical periodization of capitalism. Um, <coughs> imperialism represents um, a particular stage of capitalism uh, or, or, or some such, or, and generally where it's going. E even if imperialism isn't a particular stage, it still tells us um, that it's still, all, in a sense, a sort of carbon dating mechanism, you could say. Um, Political problems are simply that this this arrange that um, I, I argued at the, the plenary uh, yesterday with uh, uh, that the state is in some way a sort of uh, an organ uh, a central organisation of uh, of political power and relations between classes and it's clear that in terms of in imperialism um, as a, as a global system of uh, in unequal relations between states is the way that state power is organised globally so in that sense it uh, I, it is uh, the the, the paramount of the many uh, political problems uh, facing us as uh, Marxists and revolutionaries, um, you know, if you want to, if you want in that sense to, to overthrow capitalism globally, then this is you know, the very fact that this is in the sense the highest level of state power um, is a is a serious uh, uh, political challenge to us. Um, in, in in more kind of narrow terms, it, we, as as we. The introduction pointed out uh, there is the issue of the, the, the attitude that we take to uh, war, wars of, um, uh, of strong states against weaker states, or indeed vice versa, um, and, in, and beyond that, forms of quite soft war like uh, sanctions, which don't feel very soft if you're being starved as a result of it. Um, but there's another issue which has come up, particularly in the last 10 years, but, uh, but really has been nagging us uh, at least since the uh, early days of the commentary, actually, which is um, the attitude that we, that we take to uh, forces which are not, uh, strictly speaking, of the left, uh, but then end up um, confronting uh, imperialist uh, powers in, in military conflicts or other ones. Um, and this has kind of caused some serious uh, divisions on the, on the left. Um, so the, the guidebook, in that sense, for how we've uh, traditionally uh, dealt with this as a as a movement is uh, is Lenin. Uh, Lenin's um, uh, imperialism, the high stage of capitalism, which is a sort of uh, uh, brief and fairly empirical analysis of um, uh, of the of the, <coughs> of, of the nature of imperialism. But in the sense, before we have to get there. Before we even get there, the background to this is that there is the, is a, a lot, much larger debate um, in the in the Second International um, about about colonial policy uh, and imperialism um, that took place from uh, starting in about 1896. Um, and Karl who was the, the foremost leader um, of the Second International, um, uh, came a foremost theorist, I should say, uh, not leader as such, um, came up with the. Uh, Effectively, a, 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 in, a, in a series of, of articles uh, called uh, Socialism and Colonial Policy, I argued that um, effectively early modern empires, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, and, uh, and so forth, were effectively pre capitalist um, in nature um, and, and did not kind of export uh, capitalist relations to production, but was simply kind of rough, absolutist uh, exploitation operations. Um, this uh, gives way with the with the ascent of of, of England as, uh, as an imperial power to what he calls Manchesterism, and this is the um, in a, the imperialism free trade, as it were. So in, in, instead of having a rough and brutal, uh, uh, this is this is Kowski, by the way, obviously not, it's obviously not true. Uh, but instead of having uh, brutal colonial operations, what you have is. Uh, um, bringing down trade barriers and expansion of capitalism as a system. And he, he's writing about 1896, 1897, in the, yeah, by, by which point it's clear that you know, the, the, the mechanisms towards what would become World War I are, are accelerating and uh, German, uh, German states is attempting to found colonies and so forth. And um, Kowski's argument is that these are, uh, these, this sort of scramble for Africa and all these things are expressions of pre-capitalist forces in Germany and in, in other states, um, and they're actually in that sense reactionary with regard to um, uh, to, to the to Manchesterism. Um, <clears throat> uh, Lenin, um, uh, 
breaks radically with the final part of that periodization, but, does, but keeps the other two bits on, effectively on board. He argues that the imperialism is argue, the highest stage of capitalism. That with the, acceler with the acceleration of, of, of the concentration of force of production and in terms of monopolies um, and, the, and the boy force finance capital, which he takes from Hill Ferdin, uh, the fusion of industrial capital and, bank, and banking capital, um, that this uh, this is absolutely tied in with uh, with the need to, to, to sort of find um, external um, markets for, for for capital and export capital, and he argues that previous to this period of the uh, uh, empires uh, of that sort of imperial powers exported commodities rather than capital. Um, he also argues uh, quite famously that the, that this is the ground for the emergence of reform of reformism in the in the workers' movement because a, a layer of the working class is then bribed with the with the super profits of uh, um, gain from imperialism. Um, there are um, I mean uh, my, my view is that this is you know uh, ultimately not an adequate account. Um, Manchesterism never existed. And in as much as Britain uh, promoted free trade, it was because uh, Britannia ruled the waves, as, as we like to say on our side of the pond, um, and so benefited from free trade policies because we controlled all the trade routes. Um, so it was actually a, it, it was an expression of the, the British of British dominance. Um, but of course, we all know, um, certainly in India, uh, the, the brutality of, uh, of the colonial project and so forth. All that stuff didn't keep give, go away, um, and uh, uh, so. And effect, the, 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 the kind of political economic point is um, cap, uh, capital is exported um, on a large scale um, in that period as well. It's not a novel thing in the 1860s, 1890s, and so forth. Um, in fact, it goes back uh, even further, even further now, as I'll get to. Um, uh, the labour, the, the labour aristocracy explanation, or the particular mechanism that Lenin says about the labour aristocracy doesn't explain the emergence of mass reformist parties in Latin America, say, or, uh, or anywhere else that isn't an imperial power. You know, where, where is uh, Brazil's super profits that it's priming the workers' party with? Well, I, I don't see them. Um, so I would argue, on the other hand, uh, instead of that, that, in, that imperialism isn't a stage of capitalism, but is of underlying fundamental dynamic, uh, which uh, goes hand in hand with the rise of capitalist state regimes at all. Um, if you look at the first of capitalist state regimes, or the Italian city-states of the Renaissance, um, they immediately acquire colonies and, set, and export capital to the colonies to set up sugar plantations that are run by slaves. The export of capital goes back to the 15th century um, as, a, as, as, as a, an inherent part of the operation of capitalist states. Um, as soon as uh, uh, bourgeois state regimes are set up here in Holland and in uh, in, uh, in Portugal and, and other early modern empires, not all early modern empires are capitalists, by the way. The Spanish Empire simply reproduces feudalism um, and doesn't doesn't gel together in the same way. Um, but many of the early modern empires, like, like the Dutch and so forth, precisely co colonialism, uh, plantations, export of capital, um, the, 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 the expansion into uh, India um, is tied up with. Um, uh, with the British expansion to India is tied up with export, export of capital, building of railways, um, uh, cotton farms, which uh, which are tied up, which are tied in with uh, yeah, uh, tied in with uh, uh, the the the, yeah, the, the northwest of the, the, the high of industry and in the northwest of England, uh, and so <coughs> and so on. Um, and I, the, the, going beyond uh, beyond that, the, the there is a tendency um, for uh, he hegemonic states to arise that are, that are dominant in, in terms of the world order. Um, simply uh, because, you know, in that sense, the, uh, some, because capitalism needs a state to even reproduce itself um, uh, in, in any meaningful sense, it equally needs some kind of uh, means, of, means of international kind of coercion to enforce international trade and capital is fundamentally an international mode of production. Um, so, you know, you have the, 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 the Dutch um, Dutch supremacy was supplanted by British supremacy um, and uh, 
this is uh, the, 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 the project of being uh, hegemonic in this respect uh, leads ultimately to kind of uh, one way or another to sort of uh, sort of hypertrophy of, of the military and also of, uh, of kind of the or of uh, financial um, capital, as it were, um, which then leads to problems of overstretch and and of decline. And the thing that Le what Lenin interprets as the kind of terminal stage of capitalism, that he's absolutely correct. The, state, the global order is breaking down. But what's happening, and what is clear has happened from the subsequent history, is that British hegemony is being supplanted by um, American hegemony. And it's clear now that the kind of, I would say, the US, the US dominance has peaked, although it's not going away anytime soon. And it's clear from the out actual outcomes of the Iraq or the Afghanistan war, which is simply chaos. And I was sitting with a comrade earlier, uh, reading a letter from a, a Pakistani comrade about simply the, the decay of that society. It's not so it's in the Afghanistan that's being destroyed, but Pakistan is on the verge of becoming a failed state. And this is the pattern, at least in Somalia. Somalia barely exists as a state anymore after. You know, 20 years of being messed around. Um, so, in terms of the, the kind of the conclusions we, we draw from that, it is it is it is a political necessity to, um, for us to uh, disrupt imperial, uh, imperialist activity, and it will be it will inevitably as long as we have capitalism, we will have these kinds of problems. It doesn't matter who the top dog happens to be at a particular time; it is the U.S. at the moment. Um, but this will be. Uh, a mechanism for the imposition of, of capitalist order. So in that sense, the final question, yes, to, um, to be anti-capitalist is to be anti-imperialist, um, if we're going to be strict about both terms. Um, uh, the, uh, the other side to it is that because there precisely isn't a hard division simply between the imperial, uh, imperialist countries and uh, semi-colonial countries. They're obviously countries far way up the pecking order and way down. Um, but there is always an interest in finding and jostling for position within this kind of global order, which has the consequence that the contradiction between, say, the uh, bourgeoisie or, you know, if there is a bourgeoisie in Afghanistan, I mean, God only knows, and uh, the bourgeoisie of America, is is far you know, is uh, is is nowhere near as as acute as the actual endogenous um, uh, class conflicts within within the country in the country itself between the classes. Um, there there isn't a division which Lenin's theory leads us to expect between um, a sort of a patriotic, as it were, bourgeoisie as the Zionists used to call it. Or, uh, something of that kind, and uh, and uh, and the comprador class. Actually, the, 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 there is all there is a little bit of comprador in in sort of all, in all these forces, just being borne out again and again by the by the core of kind of uh, nationalist uh, struggles and so forth. So it's incorrect to yeah, uh, incorrect to uh, um, in that sense just uh, big up whoever happens to be fighting the U.S. at the time because. It cannot be. They, it is impossible for them to be consistently anti-imperialist, um, and eventually the disaster will result. And I'll finish there. Over time. Thank you. Okay, Joseph. Hi, I'm uh, the editor of Communist Voice, and since you're not available, uh, since you're not familiar with Communist Voice, let me just remark that the little table in the back on the left side is that there, there's some Communist Voice. And, here, there's also a handout here with a list of articles relevant to the subject which you can find on the internet in Communist okay. Voice. So, the struggles of the Arab Spring have led some to ask, should we side with anti-imperialism or should we back the anti-fascist struggle? But this is a false dichotomy. There is neither real anti-imperialism or real anti-fascism without the masses. I would call such supposed anti-imperialism non-class anti-imperialism, a would-be anti-imperialism that attributes everything to the maneuvers of this or that Western power or corporation, but somehow misses what's going on among the masses. Non-class anti-imperialism is very widespread in the left. Over the last few decades, it has repeatedly degenerated into support for oppressive tyrannies, prettification of new imperialisms, and despair at the prospects of mass struggle. 
Some groups even regard the Taliban as waging an anti-imperialist struggle in Afghanistan. All this has threatened to discredit anti-imperialism in the eyes of millions of people. The non-class anti-imperialists argue that once a regime comes into contradiction with the U.S. government, even such a regime that has worked closely with U.S. imperialism before, then the internal situation in that country is irrelevant. It argues that, didn't Lenin say in his article, Socialism and War, that it didn't matter who attacked first, India or Britain, that it would be a war of aggression on Britain's part and a war of defense on India's. Was there any reference there to the internal situation in India? But Lenin argued that a great revolutionary wave was spreading across India and elsewhere in Asia, <coughs> a gigantic movement which imperialism was seeking to suppress. Millions among millions and millions of oppressed people were standing up against old social relations and national oppression, and this had been going on for decades. War was the continuation of politics by other means. So since a movement of liberation was taking place in India and elsewhere, since the long-standing issue was the democratic movement in India and the fight against colonialism, any war should be judged in that light. In that light, such things as who struck first was not particularly relevant. So the issue today is what were the long-standing, what is the long-standing situation of decades that has led to the Arab Spring and such things as the uprising against Gaddafi and the Assad regime. It's that the people of the, of the region are standing up to demand a say in their lives. The situation now is different from the revolutionary wave in the immediate years after World War II. Then in the Middle East, there were a series of struggles that brought colonies to independence or overthrew monarchies. In some countries, working class parties fought for influence. These struggles changed the face of the Middle East and North Africa and brought economic development, albeit it was capitalist modernization. But in country after country, the resulting governments became long-lasting dictatorships that humiliated the working people and destroyed their organizations or made these organizations into adjuncts of the government of the ruling bourgeoisie. These governments spoke in terms of the old ideals and aspirations of the people, and even in terms of socialism. But the old revolutionary movement was dead. Typical of the reality of these countries is that the supposedly anti-imperialist regimes in Syria and Libya cooperated with U.S. and British imperialism in the torture of each other's prisoners. What's going on today is neither a recolonization of the region nor a struggle with an anti-imperialist banner. The mass is seeking to write the right to breathe in their own countries. It is not the result of the outside manipulation of foreign powers, although these powers are all seeking to either smash the movement or use it to their interest. But no upsurge against these regimes could have succeeded without the outside powers and imperialists being divided among themselves. Perhaps this, this would make it appear that we're facing a wave of democratic revolutions in the Middle East, like those sweeping Asia earlier. But this is not so. We are facing important struggles that may end the decades of political stagnation, but no matter how bitter and protracted the fighting, they are not democratic social revolutions of the old type. What is taking place in the Arab world are democratizations or liberalizations, as took place in the Philippines with the downfall of the Marcos dictatorship, as took place in Mexico with the end of the one-party rule of, of the PRI, as took place in Eastern Europe and Russia with the downfall of state capitalism. These are revolutions in a narrow sense, but in these countries, capitalist development had generally proceeded far enough, so there was no other basis for the old-style democratic social revolution that eliminated feudalism or semi-feudalism in the countryside. And yet the working class was far too disorganized for there to be the possibility of a socialist revolution. The democratic social revolution was a matter of the past. The socialist revolution, the matter of the future, still in existence. This affects the character of these movements, where over and over again, resulting regimes are disappointment. In, in these struggles, the working class may fight, but is politically disorganized, as is around the world. Nowhere in the world yet does the working class lead such struggles. So the result of these struggles, if these struggles are, are successful, is that the political situation might open up to this or that extent, but the regimes will make, even carry out market fundamentalist measures. The masses may achieve some political rights, but not economic liberation. So these are not the grand liberating revolutions of one dreams, but they're liberalizations with the possibility of an intensified class struggle taking place. Does this mean that these struggles are useless? Not from the Marxist standpoint. For Marxism, the class struggle is the path 
towards organizing the working class and preparing for the socialist revolution. From the point of view of utopianism, these struggles have failed. From the point of view of helping the working class organize, these struggles are essential. If one really believes that the working class and mass revolution are the motors of history, then these struggles are our struggles, these struggles are our comrades. If one disregards these struggles, one becomes a utopian, or worse, an unwitting backer of rival imperialisms. This situation has been a test of the political stance and theoretical views of the various trends in the left. Some supported these struggles when they thought they had the possibility of bringing the liberation of the working class. The Trotskyites, for example, had to do this as part of their theory of so-called permanent revolution. Various these groups declared that these struggles either had to bring the working class to power or they would accomplish nothing. Such declarations might appear exciting at the height of the mass upsurge, but they lead to fits of depression as these struggles continue and disappoint the Trotskyist groups. The Trotskyist theory had a market utopian flavor, either full liberation now or forget it. Let's also look at the standpoint of an ordinary pure Democrat. I know this doesn't sound like a very radical thing to, to consider, but it's instructive. Marvin Bashawa is a senior political analyst at Al Jazeera, and he wrote a book called The Invisible Arab, The Promise and Peril of the Arab Revolution. This book is an expression of a certain stage of the Arab awakening, namely the period of democratic euphoria, and he is passionate about about uh, how, he, how he calls today's revolution, sorry, his passion about what he calls today's revolution and how he's completing the previous wave of struggles. In his terms, it is liberating the people while he says the earlier struggles liberate the land. He has no idea that the class, social, and political alliances that are bringing the Arab Spring are inevitably going to break down and lead to a period of struggles, haggling, and popular depression nor does he realize how serious is the threat of very horrible setbacks, such as periods of fundamentalist government. He has no idea that democracy and liberalization lead to class struggle, and that the more thorough the democracy, and the more successful the working class in utilizing this democracy, the more intense the resulting struggles. From the standpoint of the political trend I support, it was clear from the start that in the Arab Spring, everywhere different class factions opposed the old regimes. Everywhere different class interests were represented in the movement. It was also clear that these struggles did not have an anti imperialist banner, and that their need to resort to a certain amount of Western imperialist military support was a danger to them. We neither glorified their nature as the great revolution, nor were we disillusioned when the mixed nature of the results of these struggles become apparent. We continue to expose Western imperialist motives, but we also recognize the legitimacy of the insurgent people who are utilizing differences among the foreign powers. This mixed situation is characteristic of the struggles of today. The working class today is disorganized and in crisis around the world. And the working masses are divided by a multitude of differences. In this situation, the major struggles that break out are not dominated by a revolutionary viewpoint. But to abandon these struggles means to make a mockery of belief in the class struggle. So we have a choice. Either utopianism, abstaining from all struggle until somehow the one great revolutionary struggle appears, or knowing where the working class interest lies in these struggles, and using these struggles to have the working class learn the interests and features of the different classes and becomes class conscious. But none class anti-imperialism judges these struggles not by their effect on the masses, but on how they affect the relations between the different imperialist powers. It doesn't realize the temporary gains or losses of this or that big power or this or not this or that multinational cooperation may be the most minor aspect of the struggle. The main aspect is how far these struggles open a pathway to the class struggle. Moreover, the non-class anti-imperialists also misunderstand the nature of imperialism today. It's not enough to say that imperialism still exists today. One has to be able to see what's changed in the world situation how the basic features of imperialism remain despite this. Several of these changes are of particular importance of today. For the sake of brevity, let's deal with just one, the rise of new imperial powers. The non-class anti-imperialists believe that the only, country, the only countries which were imperialists a century ago can still be imperialists today. They ignore <coughs> the rise of new imperialist powers and would-be imperialist powers. 
They may look toward the governments of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, as some type of bulwark against U.S. imperialism. But the working masses of the BRICS face the opposition of their governments and bourgeoisies in these countries. This has been dramatized by what happened at the latest of the annual meetings of the BRICS governments, this time in Durban, South Africa, late last month. Activists from the social movements in South Africa organized the BRICS from below, countersummit against the BRICS from above meeting of, of BRICS governments. One of the main organizers of this countersummit was the South African activist Patrick Bond, who described the BRICS countries as sub-imperialists, not anti-imperialists. He described in detail examples of how these countries join in world imperialism and, and, and act like imperialists. Now, it's not just the BRICS bourgeoisie who have gone in imperialists. Any bourgeoisie of a country which has some advantages allowing it to exercise influence has sought to become its own imperialist power and join the dance of, of the big powers. The strategic position, oil money of the Arab world has financed these imperialist strivings in the larger or more powerful countries in that region. Failing to recognize the new imperialisms and backing one imperialist or regional capitalist power against another is a travesty of anti-imperialism. We live in the most powerful imperialist country, which is still the world's only superpower. But the only way to undermine US imperialism is to build support for the development of working class struggle around the world. What aids this ultimately aims the, aids the anti-imperialist struggle. What aids other imperialist powers seeking to hold down the working class retards this. Thank you. And Larry. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> what should we think about imperialism? Let's start with what it has done to Iraq over the last 10 years. We need the theoretical, and especially living in this country that has created so much murder and mayhem all over the world, we need a visceral sense of what imperialism is. In Iraq, over 120,000 people killed directly in the war. 1.2 to 1.4 million people have died since 2003, the invasion. Over 4 million wounded and injured. Over 44, 4 million, 4.5 million driven from their homes. Some of you may have heard some of this before, but I think living in the belly of the beast, we have to be living with this every day. And understand what this has done to the people of the world. What about the situation of women in Iraq? Constitutionally worse, a secular constitution replaced by Sharia law. Two million widows, an epidemic of violence against women that's more and more institutionalized. In Fallujah, there's a rate of malformation of children that's greater than Hiroshima due to the white phosphorus and the depleted uranium weapons that have been used in Fallujah beginning in 2004. There's a torture and degradation of thousands and thousands of Iraqis in US-run prisons, and then the US fostering of a, of a reactionary sectarian civil war by the government that it put in power under Maliki that's included torture using electric drills, massive ethnic cleansing, secret US support for death squads, the so-called Salvador option, as Rumsfeld, Rumsfeld put it. And this follows, what, 12 years of economic sanctions, 13 years of economic sanctions that I saw firsthand when I traveled to Iraq and saw children starving to death or dying from diarrhea and not a goddamn Western cameraman in sight. I was walking around with a camera. I documented. Of course, this wasn't something shown on US television. And what we're describing here in Iraq, we could discuss any country around the world, especially from West Africa all the way to Afghanistan and the horrors that imperialism is raining down or preparing to rain down on the people of the world. And then we can talk about the fact that 22,000 children die every single year, that there's a global sex trafficking industry feasting on and, and despoiling and based on rape of millions of women a year. There's the destruction of the environment. There's 
the global horrors of poverty. All this is a product of imperialism. And, you know, the, and, and I just want to say the single greatest obstacle to humanity today is, is imperialism. It's a system of imperialism, particularly U.S. imperialism. And the single greatest thing that we could do for humanity is overthrow U.S. imperialism at the soonest possible moment and usher in a world free of imperialism or begin that process. What is imperialism? To be clear, the invasion of Iraq was not Bush's war, as so many thought. It wasn't fought for corporations. It wasn't fought for the military-industrial complex. It wasn't a question of an erroneous policy <clears throat> based on faulty intelligence. This was a war of imperialism, a war fought to further the interests of a global empire of plunder and exploitation rooted in the dynamics of accumulating capital on a global scale. The US is, is maintains a global empire with a home base in the United States. The US state is the embodiment personification and enforcer of that global empire. That's the point of it. Um, and whatever, whoever's in power, as we've seen with Obama, that's the function and role of the US state, is to maintain this global system of empire. This is a system that requires, requires the exploitation of markets, labor, and resources globally. This is a system that is based on the great division, and this is something I, I don't agree with James on. There's a great division and a fundamental production relation of domination and control of the vast majority of humanity in the oppressed countries or colonial or third world countries by the imperialist powers. Yes, is there complexity? Is there development within that? Are there certain countries like China that are, that are, uh, that relationship is evolving? Yes, they are, but we can't ever forget that that is a production relation that is foundational to the entire way the world works. And on this, Lenin is excellent, and he doesn't oversimplify. All of, the, all, of, all of this. I'm not going to get into the relevance of, of Lenin uh, today or, or um, respond to all this. But one thing that um, Lenin pointed out that I think is very, that this wasn't just a technical manual on imperialism, this was a polemic written by Lenin against social chauvinism and capitulation in the name of the fatherland and basing yourselves on bourgeoisified sections of the working class rather than those who hungered and yearned for revolution. This is why, I mean, the Second International was brought up here. This is an international of betrayal and capitulation who sided with their own imperialists in World War I and, and helped lead the slaughter of millions of people. <coughs> Lenin was the only one that broke from this and refused to go along with Kautsky's capitulation and traitorous betrayal to the people of the world. And this is a lesson that we have to learn very well here, because we have to understand every single thing about this society is steeped in and infused with a parasitism uh, that comes from U.S. position around the world and U.S. domination. I'm not arguing there isn't tons of oppression in this country. There is, among, especially among black people. The situation of women is terrible. There's tremendous amount of poverty. We know this. But nonetheless, the thinking, the social relations, the class relations are stamped, as Lenin put it, with a seal of parasitism from imperialism. So I think that one of the key things that we have to do, what our responsibility is, uh, is to point this out, to counteract this, to fight for the orientation that the whole world comes first, not the workers in this country. 
not my union, not our struggle in any particular place, but the whole world comes first and American lives are no more precious than other people's lives. And there should be right now thousands and thousands of people in the street denouncing the torture of people in Guantanamo and, the, and, the, and supporting the hunger strike those prisoners are on right now, even as they're being force fed by, by the United States. And I think we have to argue for the fact that there's no such thing as humanitarian intervention, what, whatever. This is a complete oxymoron. How can you have humanitarian imperialist intervention? Because that's what it is. And you can look at any of the countries, including Iraq, where this was done, including what was done with the Kurds, and you'll find out every single thing that the United States has done around the world is in service or perpetuating this empire of exploitation and plunder, of rivalry with other imperialist or wannabe imperialist powers, of seeking strategic advantage and maintaining control of various regions of the world, which of course is why the US is now threatening uh, Iran. So whatever, whoever the US is invading, the people in this country, uh, it's silly to, and ridiculous to say, well, gee, I was against Iraq, that was a mistake, but I think the US could do some good in Afghanistan. Bullshit. No. They're going for, what, all of a sudden they change the nature of the imperialist system because of what you want them to do, or hope they do, or think they'll do? No. The other thing we have to confront is the question of the rise of Islamic fundamentalism as a force that's clashing with the United States, uh, particularly in the Middle East, Central Asia, particularly since the since the, uh, oh, I have 10 more minutes? Great. <laughs> uh, since the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union. And um, what we're seeing, and I'm, I'm not going to, Bob Avakian, the chairman of the Revolutionary Communist Party, made a very important analysis of this, situating this as outmoded reactionary strata, one in the imperialist countries, one in the oppressed countries, country like Iran. But neither, both being reactionary, while being clear that obviously on a world scale, imperialism wreaks far more, far, far more ha havoc than even the Islamic fundamentalists, but that these two outmoded are both reactionary, their clash between each other actually fuels a dynamic if, if, in, in which if you support one, you're strengthening the other, if you side with either one. Uh, you're strengthening both of them. And this is a dynamic we urgently have to break out of. Um, and the way we have to break out of this is, is, through, is through revolution. Um, and both the other panelists have really not talked about revolution in any substantial way or treated it as a very distant prospect. But this is, a, this is a powerful system, but it's riven with deep contradictions. And revolutions are possible based on those profound contradictions, based on the fact that this system is uh, in utter antagonism to the interests of the vast majority of people, and also based on the path-breaking work Avakian has done in summing up the very important and liberatory first wave of communism from Marx through Mao. Summing that up, both its great strengths and lessons, but also its shortcoming and weaknesses, and brought forward, and even grievous errors, and brought forward a new synthesis of communism, as well as a strategy for making revolution right here in the belly of the beast. Yes, US imperialism. And I can't, I don't have time to elaborate this, the entire strategy um, that, um, that the RCP has developed, and, uh, but I, number one, recommend people see the film, B.A. Speaks Revolution, Nothing Less, which I believe, I guess they have to move the tables out, so they're outside. I recommend people see that. I would recommend that people take a look at the Constitution for the New Socialist Republic of North America draft proposal, 
which is a thoroughly internationalist document, which makes the argument that there's no genuine liberatory communist revolution that doesn't proceed from internationalism and the whole world comes first. So this constitution calls for, after the seizure of power and the institution of a revolutionary state, a revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat, the immediate dismantling of US bases all over the world, the immediate breaking of all trade and economic relations and restructuring those relations with people all over the, all over the world with making every economic decision on the basis of advancing the world revolution, meeting the needs of people here, and protecting the world's environment. And one of the key parts of the strategy, um, of this strategy for revolution is changing, is changing thinking and changing action. And in terms of changing action, we vigorously oppose, oppose all U.S. Inter intervention, sanctions, uh, threats, bullying all around the world. I'd encourage people to read our newspaper, Revolution at Revcom.us, and at the same time train people from the people locked in ghettos at the bottom of this society to the to middle class and people well off in the spirit of internationalism and in the spirit that American lives don't come first, the planet comes first. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, um, I might come in a little bit later, but I feel like there might be questions now from the audience that I could take. Um, so I will ask, um, yeah, Gregor? Um, I would like you to go, all of you, the three of you, uh, to go more into the role of the bourgeoisie today as opposed to the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, in that way I understand it at least is that the bourgeoisie under Bonapartism had really given up political power so as to keep up economic power. And that the period of imperialism around the turn of the century really also saw the merging of those two aspects again in the bourgeoisie. I wonder, um, what you would think of that today in terms of the bourgeoisie and how it is, um, what role it plays, whether nationally, internationally, multinationally, <laughs> transnationally, so uh, whether whether imperialism still operates from, from a poor nation state basis. Um, so, do you want to respond in the direction? Whatever. Uh, Yes, the state is, we're not, imperialism isn't capitalism detached from the, st from the state, detached from its base, detached from the military and machinery that enforces imperialism around the world. This is sometimes argued, as you know, that the state's disappearing, now we just have global capital unmoored from the state. That isn't true. For example, in Iraq, Halliburton didn't invade. The U.S. military invaded. Um, the second thing, and you know, just briefly, is that um, so this is this is an imperialism that's global, but still very much anchored in in the nation state, and hence, um, you know, the actions of the U.S. around the world. A and even though imperialist rivalry, rivalry between different states, isn't as pronounced as it was, say during the Cold War when the social imperialist Soviet Union was in contention with the United States, it exists nonetheless. The other thing I just want to say briefly on the question of the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie, of course, in the imperialist country, countries has no progressive role whatsoever to play any place in the world. Nothing for it. And in the oppressed countries, What's been shown is that for to achieve liberation, the bourgeoisie cannot lead that struggle. The proletariat led by a vanguard communist party, based on the science of communism, is what's necessary to lead that. As Mao showed in one of the greatest revolutions of human history, and the most, uh, and then afterward, the most. 
uh, liberatory and highest pinnacle of the communist revolution that's existed to date. Now, the Chinese revolution, as I mentioned, was led by a vanguard, but there was a role that was played by the national bourgeoisie and other elements of the bourgeoisie in that revolution, but led by the proletariat, not led by the program of the bourgeoisie. And what's been shown historically is that if these revolutions or upheavals or coup are led by the bourgeoisie, it's impossible to break the chains that are, you know, most strangling these oppressed countries, imperialism, feudalism, and thank you very much. <laughs> My time's up. <laughs> Sorry, I, I somehow missed the thread of your question. You were asking about the bourgeoisie in the oppressed countries or the oppressor countries? In general, uh, in the way and um, the, the role of the bourgeoisie in imperialism, in conducting imperialism. Conducting mm -hmm. imperialism. I mean, should we? I'll take, I can take another second well, to okay, Jason, what, what, and what then. Now, I mean, in, in, a certain, in a certain respect, I, I agree with. Um, what Larry just I don't share his high assessment of, of, uh, of Mao's China, but um, in that respect, there is, it seems to me, it's, it's straightforwardly true that it's uh, um, that where you, know, where, you, where, you gen where you genuinely have had a, a, a situation where national liberation movements or whatever haven't ended up simply in semi colonial countries, is when you have had what's one sort of communist party or another that's armed to the teeth. And you know, take, in that sense, uh, taking charge. So, yeah, it, it tells you something. It, it is a, 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 a historic failure of Stalinism. It's, uh, and in, it, those things have ended up uh, leading equally to, to nowhere on the longer time scale, which is the, the problematic. Um, uh, the, <coughs> the bourgeoisie as, as a kind of well, the thing is that the, the, it's Obviously, there is a, there's a distinction between the bourgeoisie as a class and the bourgeois state regime and system of bourgeois state regimes and this, in that sense, imperialism. Um, but nonetheless, it is like, these state regimes of bourgeois. Um, there, the, the, um, uh, there, there are uh, uh, innumerable ways in which uh, <coughs> in which the capitalist class sets, uh, sets limits and uh, enforces, in that sense, positive policy on 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 the, on the state regimes, uh, ranging from uh, uh, <coughs> uh, so, yeah, simple kind of elaboration, uh, sort of imbrication with the bureaucracy, to in some cases obviously straightforward bribery, to um, indirect bribery of uh, media apparatus, to advertising subsidies, and something that large scale, yeah, um, large scale capital operating in the media. Um, so you know, I don't, I don't, I, 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 I don't think the role of the bourgeoisie has changed in imperialism as such. What has changed, uh, as uh, uh, as as, his, as historical circumstances change, how that has happened to play out, um, has been has been transformed. Um, but uh, the, the role of the bourgeoisie in, in all this has always been well. It's uh, it's required. It's a necessary. It's a necessary feature for them to. Um, be successful in their exclusive. I, I see Richard looks desperate at the back to say something, so I, I'll take this. Away. Well, I, I guess I had a series of, of fairly specific historical questions for everybody. One is, uh, I'm curious how people would regard the Second World War. Would any of you have supported the Allied side? Uh, and if so, why is that not an imperialist war, and what would be the meaning of that? And I guess I'm also curious, particularly from James Turley, that how you, or everybody, how you perceive certain important non-state actors, such as the UN and the EU, or those imperialist institutions, the United Nations and the EU. And I guess, like, I'm also curious about how you perceive, like, like for example, the Arab Spring was mentioned in the Middle East, and, I'm, and one country that is often seen as a classic example of sub-imperialism, of course, is Israel. Yet, I mean, one of the things that's interesting is, for example, in 48, most of the left, including the communist movement of the Soviet Union, supported the creation of Israel. So I'm, I'm curious whether you would see, for example, the various wars that happened between Israel and various Arab states as anti-imperialist wars on the Arab side that should have been supported, or whether you'd have a critical attitude towards both sides. So I'm, I'm just sort of curious about the more specific questions. And also, like, there seemed to be a difference in that some of the people were emphasizing inter-imperialist rivalry, whereas the speaker from the RCP seemed to think 
that there really wasn't any inter-imperialist rivalry anymore, and that basically the U.S. ran everything. Okay. Beginning with regard to the Second World War, the Allied imperialists, obviously, were still imperialists, still had imperialist motives, and when they had the chance, they crushed the liberation movements they temporarily allied with. However, the working class did have an interest in the, in the issue of, the, of, of defeat of, of, the world, of the fascist powers. So it provided a, a complicated question. There was an interest in defeating the fascist powers. They should have been more vigilant with regard to the imperialist, the imperialist interests of, of the Allies. With regard to non-state actors such as the UN, the EU, etc., I think that's an extremely important point. Because I think the, U, the UN precisely is a world imperialist agency and it represents the interests of the leading imperialist powers. So I sometimes I'm astonished when people say, oh, you know, we're against what's going on and say this or that in our country, but of course the UN says otherwise. Well, what do you think the UN is? Whose interests does it represent? Whose interests does Ban Ki-moon represent? So yes, these are these are in, in, in imperialist agencies. As 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 to Israel, the uh, Soviet Union supported the creation of Israel as part of a very corrupt deal for the sake of it thought that it could throw British imperialism out, out of its position in Palestine. So it could <coughs> so it could portray anything. For, for that reason. And as an example of the fact, Stalin was, 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 was the leader of a state capitalist country, carrying out an imperialist policy. And with that single act, he stabbed in the back just on every, every communist activist in the Middle East and created tremendous difficulties of, you know, for, for them. Okay, thank you. Um, Larry? Okay, uh, number one, uh, I was trying to make the opposite point, that there is inter-imperialist rivalry, although perhaps not as pronounced. I, I think you just heard that. Second, um, look, I have fundamental disagreements with both panelists on, on the question of really the whole first wave of communist revolution, uh, beginning in 1917, but then after Lenin's death and with Stalin's rise to power and especially around Mao and the Chinese Revolution. We've not time for a long discussion of, of that. I would love to get into it, and the RCP's written quite a bit on this. But I just want to point, I just want to make this very clear. Uh, you know, and we've critiqued Stalin, but upheld him in a broad sense as a revolutionary and not a state capitalist uh, country. I want to make that clear. But having said that, one of the key elements of Bob Avakian's new synthesis, which applies especially to Stalin, but also to some degree uh, of Mao, revolves around the question of internationalism. In other words, any socialist state is faced with a contradiction between advancing the world revolution on one hand and, and um, Maintaining state power when you're being assaulted by imperialists from all sides. This is a very acute contradiction. And let's make criticisms of Stalin fine, but realize what he was up against in the Nazis. And, the, and that doesn't justify errors. I'm not saying that. So, um, so this line that, that the, uh, the, both the agreement with the British uh, to found Israel and the whole conduct of World War II represented a subordination of the world revolution to the needs of state power in the Soviet Union, as real and legitimate as those were. But it was an incorrect subordination of the world revolution. We can look at Greece, we can look at a lot of other examples to um, uh, to the needs and even an identification of whatever advanced the interests of the Soviet Union with the advance of the world revolution, and that isn't true. And so this was this is the way that Avakian's thinking has gone much further. And I would just um, I would just say that um, you know the state of Israel is uh, 
a client state and an embodiment of imperialist interests in the Middle East, a settler colonial state that has no legitimacy whatsoever and is based on the ethnic cleansing uh, of Palestine and, and should be resolutely opposed and the masses rising up against Israel supported. And look, this is a key responsibility we have in this country is to expose and oppose the state of Israel, not because of the Zionist lobby and so on, but going back to our discussion, Israel supported by the United States because it serves imperialist interests, not because the the Zionists have a powerful lobby in Washington, D.C. And so this is part of exposing U.S. imperialism, is exposing the crimes of Israel. Thank you. Um, James? Um, okay, I have interest. I mean, in, in terms of, in terms of uh, rivalry, in, in various rivalry, it, you know, it, is a, it is a feature, but they just have the, 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 the truth in that sense is sort of uh, complicated in between thing because there is a dominant power. You know, there, are, there, there is rivalry, but there is no rival to the U.S. at the moment. Uh, the U European Union is not able to marshal military forces in the way they could inflict a defeat on uh, America. Uh, China, possibly in another 30 years, and again Europe <laughs> maybe soon. But at the moment, no, no one. That that's the, that's the thing. That's the fundamentally what we're dealing with. Um, uh, the matter of Israel and kind of uh, national you know, sort of Arabs, Arab wars against it. Well, in that sense, the the Soviets' angle to it, a rather Cold War angle to this, is is crucial. I mean, we've been through the sort of the, the, the business of 1948 and uh, uh, and that, and yeah, actually, even even yeah, even groups or whatever like uh, Shatner's group, uh, the Workers' Party. Um, who would have thought of them actually hated Stalinism are still working in an environment, in a political environment where like the left-wing positions are partially, um, partially emanate from uh, the power of the official communist movement. So I've, I've done, you know, it is, isn't surprising that that is the, and that Israel presents itself in leftish forms, in you know, leftish face of the world at the time, you know, with the kibbutz in the north, all that kind of thing. As far as the wars, uh, well, I mean, it, again, judge it, you know, judge it. Um, concretely, I'm probably you know, some of these regimes are quite uh, were fighting against as well, very, very re reactionary in themselves, and actually in fact, have become client states uh, of the United States. So it's more complicated when you look at things like Egypt and uh, I guess Syria and sort of uh, and the kind of Baathist, uh, various forms of Arab nationalism. Uh, but fundamentally, this is about uh, they, these people are in the kind of Soviet sphere of influence, so you end up with this kind of socialistic form of nationalism. Which actually end up later. It is the same people who uh, who transform themselves into a straightforward, uh, uh, in that sense, a state capitalist, if you will, bourgeoisie. And that's that's clear what that's clear what the situation and environment regime is in by the time of that. Um, so uh, it's, it's sort of more more complicated. It's clear that you know that, that these social forces can only be anti-imperialist to a certain point. To actually, that's made very clear. Like, and of course, yeah, uh, Israel is a separate bone state, and it, yeah, it used to be. Uh, uh, I've always been agree with the Palestinians. So that one, uh, inter international bodies, the UN. Well, what these are, are crys you know, crystallizations of, of relations of forces on a on a global level, both economic and, and military. So in that, they are both uh, tool in, the, in this modern situation. The U uh, UN in particular is uh, effectively a, a tool. You know, a, a tool of the US led state order in order to maintain that in certain ways. And, you know, it's clear who, who, who runs things. And the EU is kind of more complicated because um, like more hegemonic forces within it will represent potential rivals to the US generally, but it nonetheless is a kind of local expression of the of, of the balance of forces, which is why it's kind of a little bit you get lefties who think that everything in Greece will be sold if they they leave the EU. It's so like that's not the point. The EU isn't isn't the dominant isn't domination itself. It's a, it's an aspect. It's tied in with it, and it sort of reflects it. So, um, well, World War Two. Um, it's an interimperialist war to an extent. Though there is a technical problem, which is that the Soviet Union was non-capitalist, uh, whatever you call it, and uh, wasn't imperialist in the straightforward um, sense. Um, but it, in that sense, it's a it's a part of a 
more uh, longer term kind of historical historical process, and we are we are dealing with the, the kind of historic failure to to um, turn the crisis of British um, hegemony into uh, into a, into a revolution that, in that sense, it could have been the global revolution that would have uh, persisted. Um, I, I, I don't think there's an easy answer to like who side where you want. I think Trotsky is interesting. I mean, Military military policy. I'm still not going to come back. Can we say a little more on this? Is um, uh, can I can I take one more question and maybe okay, respond? Mine is a bit of sort of bringing it to what they said, bring it to vision. Um, I think that one of the motivations for this panel is you know the inner side of the ten years of the Iraq War, um, and I. We realize that the three people in the panel actually have the word communists in the title of their organizations or publications. Um, and one of the questions for this panel that I remember sort of briefly reading is the question of assessing whether or not the anti-war movement against the war in Iraq actually moves the working class or con towards a communist or a struggle towards socialism. And the answer, I think, in the context of the CPTB was no, it did not manage to do that. I'm not sure how. Um, you two would ask that question, but if it's only now, um, if the answer is definitely no, I think that five years ago it was definitely something people would have not answered no. Now, has there been enough distance that we can assess the why? Why was it that the anti war movement, and it was millions really strong in multiple cities across the world, the anti war Iraq movement, uh, why has it now not been able to actually build a movement towards socialism? a working class, proletariat, class conscious struggle for socialism. Why was it unable to do that, in your estimation? Uh, Larry, do you want to take that? Sure. Just one thing off the last thing. Look, the, the term Stalinism is just an anti-communist, anti-revolutionary, <laughs> um, shorthand taking advantage of bourgeois anti-communism that posits Communism is about a totalitarian dictatorship. And in case I wasn't clear, the Soviet Union led by Stalin, I was pointing out some errors in their foreign policy, but on the, on the part of the Soviet Union and Stalin, that was a tremendously heroic and just war to defeat the Nazis, which if anybody's watched Oliver Stone's series, you'll understand that that's who did it, nobody else. So I, I want to make that clear, and I think that abandoning this first wave and just really accepting the bourgeois imperialist summation of the first wave of communism is one of the greatest uh, betrayals of the people of this world, because this was an incredibly valuable and liberatory experience that has to, yes, be built on and synthesize further. We have to go farther and do better, but we are not going to do that if we reject the lessons and the victories of the greatest movement for emancipation that's ever existed in human history. And so, and it relates to the topic here at Platypus. The, the question isn't utopia as in hopeless dreams versus just being buried in present-day real politique. What this new synthesis of Baba Vakins is, is visionary and viable, emancipatory and scientific, and it's founded on studying this experience as well as much other experience. But I just, I think that's really crucial because if we're talking about imperialism, let's talk about getting rid of imperialism. And speaking of imperialism, the EU is an imperialist institution. The UN is an imperialist institution. France intervening. Larry, in are you like to actually try to address this through the? I am. Process. I'm going to. But look, a lot. Let's have some actual. You know, let's get into some substance here. What the real uh, differences are. Um, and, and so is the United Nations and France intervention in Mali. In terms of the. Uh, your point about the um, the upheaval and the mass 15 million people, new superpower in 2003. I think that that showed the potential, the depths of people's hatred of a lot of what was going on. 
but it also showed that that has to be led by a revolutionary vanguard party, that people spontaneously, even if they're opposed to a particular action of the ruling class, do not spontaneously understand you know, what's driving this, what's the solution to this, and the sacrifices and struggle that are needed in order to overcome this. And I think a particularly important thing is the revolutionary movement that I'm talking to has to be rooted in those that society has cast off. I was in San Francisco, I was at that demonstration, and afterward, um, I think what happened is a lot of people got sucked into the illusions of U.S. democracy, that if you simply get rid of Bush or vote for Kerry, as people did in 2004, that somehow things were changed. They didn't understand what we're talking about today, that you know what exists in the US isn't democracy, it's capitalism, imperialism, and political structures that support that. I think the other thing uh, that, that you know, people don't want to face intellectually and in terms of their activity is what is it actually going to take to go up against US imperialism. And I think that was also a factor in people coming out in their millions in a very important protest that showed a lot of potential, including globally, but um, it wasn't carried through. I mean, I do want to commend and uphold the work of World Can't Wait, drive out the Bush regime at that time. Now World Can't Wait in terms of trying to lead this upheaval in a way that really changed the whole political terrain. Short of revolution, but changed the political terrain as part of preparing for revolution. Okay, I think the anti-war movement is playing a tremendous role with regard to motivating the left. In my own case, it was the war, the war in Vietnam played a very important role in my becoming a communist. And the, the desire to defeat U.S. imperialism, to find a force that would defeat U.S. imperialism, and would do that. With regard, with regard to the struggle against the, uh, the war in Iraq, I don't think it's a flaw in the struggle against the war in Iraq that it, why things haven't moved further. I think that it's a very, it's a very serious issue that the working class is disorganized, that the well, trade unions almost everywhere are class collaborations. The political parties, which you expect to support the working class, don't. For example, the Socialist International had relations with the Mubarak regime until just before it fell, and then Ali in Tunisia had relations with the Socialist International. Now, we didn't, people here would look to the social international and many workers would. There's a whole, there's a great deal of disorganization that exists and the, and the, and the anti-war movement by itself couldn't overcome that. Now, there's this, now it's not just a matter of people's desire when, when the struggle grows to, to a certain level. There's certain objective conditions. So in my, from my point of view, I think the anti-war movement did play a tremendous role. The people who took part in will remember this, but that it alone could you know, can't, can't, one struggle alone can't necessarily, can't necessarily change the whole situation. What I would like to push you guys on a little bit is, um, uh, if, if the, uh, which is to follow on from Laurie's question, um, which is um, to, having, having recognized that the anti-war movement didn't succeed in what it was doing, I'm, I'm, what I'm wondering is if it actually contributed to a furthering of confusion about what it means to be anti-imperialist today. Well, I'm confused by that, but no. Um, uh, I'm mean, confused on the left, um, in terms of how to respond to present conflicts in Syria and Libya. Well, uh, James? I'm, well, I mean, it's, it's clear that if you you know, going on demonstrations against the war in Libya and the war in Syria were, was uh, a pretty depressing experience in, in Britain. Um, uh, there would be uh, two or three hundred people outside an embassy and half of them would be um, ex vigorously pro-Assad types um, you know, with uh, you know, a very, very dubious politics indeed. And the other half would be kind of... Uh, Liberal Iranians, and they, they were they were like getting into fights, <coughs> physical fights, um, and they, yeah, that was a far cry from 2003 when we had one and a half million people out on the street. I mean, the, the thing is, it was a it was a, a kind of enor enormous opportunity, uh, and in that sense, 
it, yeah, it, it still is, it still is a terrible, yeah, a terrible thing to say. But the fact that the, the sort of uh, endless uh, conflagrations here, there, and other, uh, everywhere keep keep arising, there, there will be there will be another anti-war movement on that scale as long as they keep having these bloody wars. Um, but the, it is. It's, a, it's an error on, it's error on the part of, I can't speak for America, it's an error on the part of the left in Britain um, that it was ne that it, 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 it didn't realise that the situation had changed after, after 2003, after the troops went in. Um, because in the run-up to that, it was clear that large parts of the international bourgeoisie, for their own reasons, thought that this wasn't a good idea. And this is why you had all this stuff about UN resolutions and the French had had the you know, certainly interest with Iraq and this, that, and the other. There was a, there were, these people were bashing heads with each other, which meant it was, a, it, it was actually easier than it was ever going to be again to get through and just like, uh, yeah, as you were saying earlier, kind of take advantage of this like little moment, and you had this enormous demonstration. But no, after that, the movement just kind of. Uh, they, they had this sort of image in their head of that they just got more people out the next time, the more people out the next time. Um, and really what needed to be done was to uh, get across the, the sort of uh, the, the fundamental, uh, you know, start arguing that it's, you know, there could have been three million of us and they would have still have done it. They would have still have done it, from my comment about Minala, to say, um, unless there was a real, like, MPs of Britain had, would, would be in fear of their lives and they'd be just hung from lampposts by their constituents if they voted for the war. Um, in the absence of that, you know, you do need a serious uh, revolutionary poll on that, and people, and that, that was never grasped. So, yes, this was, a, this was a real opening, a real opportunity. It was the, um, and uh, it will, it, it's not gone completely. Uh, but um, the, that's uh, I, I, confusion. I think the confusion stems from, from other things, which, uh, but partly from other things, which we'll maybe uh, uh, get to. Well, so I'll put it on a bit too long now, anyway. No. Um, yeah. Um, you know, first, uh, you know, the revolutionary communists weren't confused in the sense that unless you overthrow imperialism. A, wars are going to continue, and B, no mass movement is going to sustain itself in the way that perhaps some people expected. If you expect to, you know, take a spontaneous struggle, and let's let's put it this way, for this was a very broad section of the middle class and the masses of people that came out, but it was a spontaneous struggle. And the notion that you're going to simply take that spontaneous uprising and gradually push it toward revolution is, 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 is what may have confused some people. I think it's important that RCP strategy, which is in basics, and I would highly recommend people read the strategy for revolution, is seizing on all of these kind of outbreaks and crises in order to more broadly plant the pull of revolutionary communism and to raise the organization and consciousness of the masses of people that anything less than revolution is bullshit, isn't going to change anything that we're protesting. And while this wasn't a revolutionary crisis that exists, that, that took place on February 15th that you're talking about, it certainly showed the potential for millions and millions of people to be drawn into political life very quickly. But the key there is have the revolutionaries accumulated enough force, the forces, that can actually lead that in a revolutionary direction if you are in, in a revolutionary crisis and then when millions of people are determined not to live in the same way and the rulers are divided and so on, you actually have the prospect of going for state power which is ultimately the only thing that's going to, going to stop this. But certainly wars are a concentration of imperialism and something that we should expose 
you know, and where they come from and why revolution and an entirely different economic and political system uh, are needed. I do also want to just point out that one of the things the bourgeoisie did in response to this uprising was Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, whose mission was not to change what the ruling class was doing, but to bamboozle the masses into think, into into passivity. And I'm not saying it was simply Obama, but that was the chief mission of the Obama administration, electing, putting Obama in power, was rebranding imperialism and uh, you know quieting this growing. There was tremendous hatred of Bush, and it was beginning to. In many ways, you could see the seeds of a legitimacy crisis there, which didn't emerge. So. We have like five more minutes, so can I take maybe a two more questions or one more? Uh, yeah, so quickly for all three panelists, we'll be starting over here. Um, do you think that the oppressed peoples of Libya, be the working class or the peasants, um, would have been better off had the Western left been able to prevent NATO military intervention? I'm against NATO military intervention in Libya. I don't know. You know, I'm not a supporter of the Qaddafi regime. Uh, Raymond Lotta wrote a very excellent article on this in, in Revolution. But, um, you know, the NATO intervention was an intervention of imperialism to put pro-U.S. reactionaries in power, killed many, many people. That isn't to say the people of Libya, uh, if, they, if the people, if the masses of people had been involved in a genuine struggle for liberation, and I'm sure there were individuals who were out there fighting against Qaddafi who had those feelings, but if you look at the movement overall, it was very much influenced by imperialism um, from the beginning. But certainly, I and we, uh, the RCP, protested and opposed NATO intervention in Libya. The, the, the movement in Libya was not a creation of foreign powers. It was an upsurge of the Libyan people who had been suppressed for decades. No free trade unions, no free political life. Many of these people, even their national identity was denied. The Berber people in, in, in Libya were being compuls compulsory turned into Arabs, and their, and their national identity denied. The, the Libyan uprising was a genuine uprising. The, the Libyan uh, uprising prevented massive intervention, intervention on the ground. It took, it took, it wanted, it took, it took a U.S. air intervention. Without that air intervention, the likelihood is they would have been drowned in blood in, in Benghazi and elsewhere. The intervention, our task is always to expose the, the imperialist motives of our government. We know the U.S. government didn't do this out of humanitarian motives, but it was legitimate for the living for the Libyan people to utilize this contradiction among the imperialists. Almost no revolution in the world has ever succeeded unless the foreign enemies were divided. And it's astonishing that a person who defends the Soviet, the Soviet Union taking massive US, British, and French aid in World War II will deny the Libyan people the right, the, the right to, 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 have, to have freedom with, with, with a certain alliance. That said, it's a it makes a complicated political situation, and it's one of the reasons why the, why the anti-war movement gets disoriented. It is a a just legitimate feeling on the on the part of activists who wanted to knock down anything the U.S. does completely. If anyone worked with U.S. imperialism at all, then they, they must they must be you know, horrible. That's a, a certain noble feeling on the part of activists. And so when you have a situation where you simply can't take that stand that way, it creates confusion, and it does. But it's better that the Libyan, the Libyan uprising succeeded, and the situation in Libya is far better that the uprising has succeeded than, than if Gaddafi had continued to so rule. So you're supporting the air intervention, just so I understand. I said what I wanted to say. Continue okay. on to. Well, I'm not saying, sorry, I, I disagree with you. I mean, it, it, it's kind of the, the result. The results of this, I think, it's sort of too early to tell, but there are unpromising signs. What we have had is the same kind of, like, this parachuting in of a government which doesn't really seem to have, in that sense, power in the country. Um, I, I don't see that what's coming out of this is a, is a stable state regime, and already you have the signs. Like, in very accelerated form, you know, it took about, what, 10 years before uh, Hamid Karzai started uh, legalizing marital rape and things? 
Um, it's, it's all, this, is, this is already happening in Libya. Um, it's it's a uh, it's a kind of complicated. But I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's no I, there's no way around it. People, you know, if they well, pretty lot of people did die because NATO you know, blew them up. Uh, but you know, the, the, that uprising would have been crushed by Gaddafi. Um, but there could there could have been another one. It's it's clear that the problem is we're we're not learning the the, the lessons of the way that the things like um, on the basis of how things have panned out you know, in in uh, Somalia and then Iraq and then Afghanistan and then Iraq. What's clear is that the Ameri uh, the the international the US led international imperialist order is increasingly unable to impose um, impose a, a state regime even even in the kind of sense of serving its interests. There's all that stuff about, yeah, the Iraq is a war for oil, for oil, so we could have lots of cheap oil. Well, hasn't the, the price of gas has just returned to its, uh, finally dropped to the price that it was in 2003. Um, and it's because the, 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 in order to maintain uh, kind of any sort of, any sort of control on the ground, they've had to, in that sense, decompose the society. And that's why I think yeah, it's, it's extremely, uh, and yeah, well, as we were talking earlier, this, uh, I, I think this is kind of a manifestation of uh, yeah, the, 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 the euphoria of the average spring, I think, sort of uh, maybe led people to think that that was just the way that we're just going to sweep everything. And it's clear that that's not happened, that we're in a fairly, uh, fairly bad phase of it at the moment if you look at what's happening in Egypt and, and things like that as well. So absolutely, um, I think it would, it would have been better, it wouldn't have been better in the short but, run, but in the long run. But, um, but I'm completely puzzled by that response. I mean, first of all, you seem to be opposed to the intervention because they didn't impose a successful puppet regime. I mean, you said there's no stable. Well, no, 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 I just no, no, totally no, baffled. I understood under the other two speakers. The underlying I don't point understand is that what's position. better, tyranny or chaos? And I, my, my judgment is that we'll end up with chaos. But if, so, so you're, you were opposed to it because it didn't work, or because you're opposed? I mean, I'm, I don't understand your position. I understood the other two speakers. Um, you just opposed it a priori? I mean. Uh, I, I opposed it because I don't, I, the judgment was, in that sense, what, come, what, what comes out of it will be. Um, so, some kind of, some kind of, uh, in that sense, puppet regime with a very, very sort of limited sphere of influence, and then just kind of decomposition. I, so, I if there were stable regimes, look, 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 look at the kind of broad, broader pattern of what's happening in the Middle East. You know, they, so the, the, you know, it's already ridiculously divided into these competing little stateless, and they're going to be divided again because the, 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 this is. As a result of this wave, and you know, Libya is very much part of you know, this wave of uh, imperialist interventions in the region. You you can't. I, I don't. I don't believe in boxing these things off. Um, I mean, we're out of time. Could could I get more like one minute each for people yeah, to to say their final remarks? You're right in the yeah. Okay. <laughs> Would people like to give their final remarks for one one minute each? Um, mm -hmm. uh, Larry. One minute as we are spinning toward a black hole, which equals 20 years. Um, first of all, both panelists supported imperialist intervention in Libya. I think it's outrageous that they've I done didn't this. Support and imperialist I, intervention in Libya. I just got taken up with doing so, not doing so, in a confused way. Well, okay. <laughs> it sounded like you were, but that's okay. If you're not, I'm glad to hear it. Um, but I think one thing, and just in terms of this humanitarian intervention, and I think uh, he, he clearly did, um, in terms of humanitarian intervention, it isn't just the havoc wreaked in any particular country. And look, let's go back to this two out motives phenomenon. What has U.S. intervention done in Libya? It's not only uh, killed and cause much suffering, it's actually fueled reactionary Islamic fundamentalism, not only in Libya, but in Mali. How's that a good outcome? So you can't just look at the immediate situation. People argue the US protected the Kurds for 15 years, but why did they do it as a base area in order to be able to overthrow the Saddam Hussein regime and 
and lead to the deaths of other people. So this notion of humanitarian intervention, or well, in this situation, it's better than the alternative, is poison. Oops, was that longer than I did? <laughs> okay. First of all, no matter how many times you say I support humanitarian imperialism, it's a lie and you know it's a lie. I specifically said we should expose the motives of what Louis Rubinos was doing and that what was existed was a contradiction among the imperialists, which people, the people were right to take advantage of. But the main issue is, if you want to fight imperialism, you can't just, just say, well, just overthrow it immediately. Well, if you can overthrow it immediately, go ahead and do it. I support it. That is but your strategy, strategy, by the way. May I finish? <laughs> what you have to do is support these struggles that, that will organize the working, help organize the working class, which over a period of time will give rise to the revolution. You have to know how to handle, how to handle struggle, how to, at the time when the revolution isn't imminent, but struggles are breaking out. That's what I tried to indicate with the example of the Arab Spring. This is not a question of the Great Revolution taking place, but it is a question of this type of struggle that, adva that, that, that advance, advances the situation in the Middle East. Decades in which the Arab people weren't allowed to have any say in anything are being replaced by they have a say. What they say at first may not be what you want them to say, but they have to work out themselves what, what, what they're going to say. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, uh, it's so you, you can't you can't have a you can't you can't have an absolutely ridiculous, yeah, absolute like pure purist. No, you know, absolutely never pay anything from it because it's simply uh, I do support as it happens. Uh, part of your first wave of communist revolutions, and part of that was German imperialism putting Lenin on the train to Russia. So we can't, you know, it's in, our, in that sense, it's in our heritage. It's that, that dubious, slightly dubious deal theory there and there everywhere. I think the, prob the problem with this is that what you ended up with is what, what mass initiative there was in the initial Libyan uprisings was lost. It became a NATO war. <coughs> Uh, that it was simply the forces that they were sponsoring that were able to sort of take command of it. And that is as clear as what's happened in, in, happening in Syria as well. But forces with which the US believes it can do business, precisely Islamic like fundamentalist forces, ever more and more, bizarrely. Um, that, that's, that, that, that's what's in the ascendancy. So, yes, I uh, yeah, support, yeah, support the popular uprisings. I don't know what kind of, what, what the tyrant happens to think of the. Uh, U.S. international regime, but we have to we have to be you know have to really understand what's what's going on on the ground. What's going on the ground is is, um, is less euphoric, shall we say, than it was in the spring of 2011. Thank you very much. Thank you.